Thunder! 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 Thunder Geeks are live! Hello, Thundarians! You're listening to 102.7 FM CILU or around the world at LURadio.ca. I'm Andrew. I'm Rob. I'm Megan. I'm Alicia. And I'm Kyle. And, and we're, we're your Thunder, Thunder Geeks. Geeks. Have another fantastic show for you guys. Gonna be filled with fun and music and monsters. And of course, we're gonna just try to make it laugh for an hour and a half. But more importantly, uh, plugging out to the local community, very important here. Uh, Joy-Con is going to be coming up on May 27th. It's going to be happening in Dryden at the Best Western from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., $15 at the door. I'm really excited that we're getting more conventions popping up in our region, being able to see just everything build up. Now, we were planning to go. We were all on a board, and we were going to go to Joy-Con, and we still want you guys to go take pictures for us. We want to see it. But we got an email. Rob, what did we get? So, a few months ago, I mass-spammed pretty much every convention between here and Winnipeg, saying, hey, you should totally let us be press. And one of them actually messaged back, and they're like, hey, you guys are so totally press. So yeah, Anime North uh, sent us approval uh, for press passes, so we are currently trying to uh, get all of our ducks in a row here, and we're going to road trip it down for Anime North and cover it. So we, we've sent our guest list in there, we're going to hopefully hear back very soon about who we can get and who we can talk to, but yeah, we are so, so excited. This is a, this is a huge opportunity we were not expecting, because we are like, okay, yo, three weeks out, we're not going to get it. Email comes at 9 p.m., and like, oh... Geez, let's get together right now and just start planning. But it looks like we're gonna we're gonna have the whole crew there. Uh, Leisha, of course. Uh, what are you gonna be doing out there? I go there as an artist to sell my stuff. So, guess you guys just want to be one of the cool kids down there, huh? The coolest. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Rob, I know we also had another fun thing going on this week on Saturday. What was going on? Uh, we got uh, Kyle and I got to experience the joy and awesomeness that is. Free comic book day. Yay. There was a bunch of like awesome free comics this year. It was funny. I was on the bus uh, heading to work. I didn't get to go. <laughs> but there was, um, people got on the bus. And as soon as they, like there was a, a, a man and his couple kids. And he, they were driving, they, they, they went past like two stops. And they saw the, stu- the stuff going down at com- free comic book day. And they were like, let's go like they he's like do you want to go do you want to go and they're like yeah so he's like let's get off the bus they literally got on the bus got off the bus and then walked back because they really wanted to go see all the cool cosplayers who wouldn't there was like uh in front of comics plus there was raven and catwoman and joker and wonder woman yeah there was a bunch of awesome people later on i seen there was spider-man sith, yeah and the sith cosplayer was there as well yep. wasn't there one person that was like switching cosplays for the day there could have been I don't know. I just, I saw lots of cosplays. I mean, like, I know people sometimes, like, do, like, daytime, nighttime cosplays for, like, Saturday conventions, but to do it for free comic book day, that is dedication. <laughs> <laughs> they had the, uh, the 501st, I believe, were out at... At Hill City? Oh, uh, yeah. They were awesome, as always. And before we get on to other stuff, I must tell Andrew the s- hilarious tale of Rob doing a Rob. Oh, no. Oh, no. So, <laughs> me and Kyle, we finish up at Comics Plus, and we decide, hey, let's. it's a nice day. Let's walk over to Hill City, leave the car, whatever. And halfway to Hill City, I get a phone call from Jack Crow, friend of the show, and he's like, hey, Rob, where are your keys? I start patting my pockets. I'm like, I, I look at Kyle. Kyle. Kyle, do you have my keys? And, Why would I? <laughs> exactly. And then I'm like, oh, no, oh, no. And he's like, yeah, Rob, your keys are in the door of your car. <laughs> Oh, thankfully he's like, yeah, I'm just gonna meet you guys at Hill City. I, I got your keys, so that Real was a good moment. one. Yeah, that is a horrifying moment. I'd be terrified. Jack Crow, Ultimate Bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so thank you, Jack, for uh, helping us save Rob's car. And thank you to everyone who listened to my subtle, very subtle plug of the show. <laughs> Rob. Hey. 
Hey, you guys, you should totally listen to our show. Well, Rob is subtle as a freight train, and I love him for it because he <laughs> he has absolutely no shame for me. I, I go up to people like, hey, I, I do this thing. Please listen. And Rob's like, we are the greatest thing that's ever happened since Swiss cheese. Have you ever had Swiss cheese? It's fantastic. And we're battered. I'm like, Rob, pull it back. I'm like, no. And he pushes me off to the side. I start crying on the floor, and then he just hands out business cards. See, I know you have, like, the, here you go approach to it meanwhile i like slide up beside raven i'm like hey how's it going here's a card wink like, wink <laughs> nudge nudge hey? just slip it in how's it going sometimes i just i just happen to be talking to people and then i find some uh, common ground with them and then i'm like yeah kind of so yeah here's here's my page with me and my friends we do this thing every weekend and most of the time they actually end up liking our page and I'm just like, yes! Rob takes the shotgun approach no matter where he is, including the hospital. <gasps> we should get you a shotgun that shoots business cards. That, <laughs> no! <laughs> yes! Absolutely not! Yes, absolutely yes. yes! I will not be woken up by a fury of paper cuts, okay? <laughs> oh, I wouldn't use on you. You're already here. I'd like wake up and it'd just be like... Remember the Clone High episode where he dies by the garbage? Yep. <laughs> That's what would happen. Just Maude Flanders t-shirt cannon, but I it's was Kyle and business card. Oh, I was yeah. just going to say the like, t-shirt cannon. Like, I'm, just, I'm just imagining. We need a t-shirt cannon. <laughs> you know when like, people like like shoot flamethrowers up in the air like, Rah! and it's just a big cloud of flame? Well, instead it would be like a big cloud of, of Thunder Keith cards. Cards. <laughs> <laughs> Continuous stream. Oh, you know those you know those those guns the, that the shoot, shoot money. The, the shoot the money. Yeah. Yeah, we should get one of those but like for smaller. When people well, for business cards. Yeah, when someone's like super lazy and they want to like throw throw hundreds, they just get the gun and they're like just me, just me at Anime North just please love us and then I get And then everyone's for running literally. screaming because they're getting hit by business cards. <laughs> And of course, guys, if you want to take a peek inside the studio, you can also do so on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash thundergeekspeak, where we're streaming live on Facebook. Now, Rob, I understand you had an interesting question for everyone, and you want to post it to us here. I post it to you, and I post it to all the people who listen at Free Comic Book Day, and that is, who do you guys think comic book's best lover is? <laughs> now, I want to clarify some things that I clarify with our listeners. Okay. This isn't about quantity of partners. This is about quality of partners so is this like who do you think is the best lover like towards their their other person or who you think would be a best lover for you personally who do you think would leave more partners satisfied in general oh that, that's a completely different question <laughs> um so I, I see kyle's perked up would you like to go okay as we stated when we were inside of hill city the character i have chosen is please the red lantern Pl Why? Why? Please explain. No, I want to hear your reasoning. Okay. Now, the stereotypical rough and brooding girl who's all violent is usually like a super satisfying and nice person on the inside. She's not. So she's going <laughs> to... <laughs> <laughs> no, let's let's see where this is going. I'm curious where this is going. This is going to give us some deep uh, insight into Kyle's psyche here. Now, there's a lot more people who like to be uh, submissive, let's say. And I guarantee you, without a shadow of a doubt, Blaze is going to show up and just start whipping you with her wings, and, like, everybody's going to be satisfied by the end. She might even, like, bloody gurgle on you, and you'll be good. <laughs> See? So you don't stop at any point in the month. No. It's, it's all man. month every day. I don't know why. But I have a feeling like, uh, um, oh, I don't know. I thought about it for a long time, and I was, uh, I was thinking about maybe Wolverine would be a good lover. Shocker. Um, <laughs> well, he does have hundreds of years of experience. Does he really, though? Because, I mean, after oh. he meets up with the X-Men, I just see him, you know, pretty much sitting there, getting cucked by Cyclops, and just saying, oh, gee, <laughs> please love me. And he's like, she's like, yeah, okay, Logan, go over there, you creepy old man. Hey, hey, that's only in the movies. In the comics, he gets around to the point where there's some speculation, nothing confirmed or denied, that he has slept with Nightcrawler. Ooh, man, he could teleport front to back just for a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> and according to uh, Nightcrawler's creator, Nightcrawler's packing double guns down there. Whoa, whoa, what? Hold like a lizard? <laughs> like like, like one over top of the other. Like Man, I wonder if he can like get a helicopter going. <laughs> no, at that point it's a biplane. 
that's when you're connected to both. Now I finally understand why Nightcrawler is definitely one of my favorite characters. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Welcome Turns out Megan's favorite animal is a shark, too. <laughs> I love sharks. I do love sharks. Well, see, as Megan thought about this, you know, long and hard, I thought about, <laughs> I, I thought about this for three seconds, and I'm going to go with Mystique, because she can literally become anyone for anyone, right? And she could probably, like, modify how exactly. well her so, area is. So who would Mystique become for you? Oh, You know... If we're talking mystiques in context of film, give give me the Jennifer Lawrence. Yeah, Lawrence one. What, was that the actress? She's gonna become Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shocker! Um, I feel like Vision might be a good lover too. I don't know why. I don't. No, really? I think he'd be too tactical. Like he wouldn't be able to improvise. <laughs> Seal Team Six, we are coming in for landing. <laughs> <laughs> perfect that's perfect for me i am engaging the in and out process in out, out in <laughs> out in out climax that is all i know i know that uh the silk specter would, would you like some cab fare <laughs> <laughs> the worst i know that silk specter wasn't really satisfied with dr manhattan after a while because she's all weird and there's something wrong with her but dr manhattan can electrify his fingers. Oh man, not only can he do that, he but can he also can make be- multiple of himself. Exactly. <laughs> and he can kind of teleport. So, I mean, he could like both Nightcrawler this and Mystique this at the same time because he can also create matter and it's implied he can create life. Wait, hmm. wait, I have... Hmm. Cosmic since, beings are no fair. Since it's an actual like comic book, Rick. <gasps> Rick Sanchez. Yes. <laughs> I would dispute that. I would think Unity's better. But uh, Rick satisfied Rick, all of Unity. Rick comes That's with fair. all of his toys, including a Mii Seeks <laughs> box. He can hit that button 400 times, and they all have to do the job before they go away. <laughs> <laughs> would but you aren't want the, to, though? Would you want to make love to a Mii? <laughs> <laughs> but aren't the Mii Seeks, I don't know, ill-equipped? How do you know? Well, they're not wearing any clothes, and you don't see any dingle dangles. And they can't. I would. I, I would think the uh, the Mystiques can't because they don't reproduce. They just come into existence and zap out. If they did reproduce, they would have to have the will to live. <laughs> they have Thus, a- Mystiques <laughs> cannot produce just through biological implication. <laughs> there's no. There's no reproduction here. I'm talking about their like big clubby hands. They could just start like. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. They have, like, mitten hands. Just wrist it. Yeah, they got, like... <laughs> I was going to say knuckles. Well, what if you ordered the Meeseeks to be the greatest lover? Don't they, don't they, by, you know, compulsion, have to be? Yeah, they'd have to find a way. <laughs> the love Here's finds a-, a way. <laughs> so, Andrew, I want to know what yours would be. Okay, so I think I've already been beat because my my, my oh, forever argument's always going to be Nightwing. He is the greatest lover of the DC Universe. No one has ever reported a bad experience. People have reported a bad experience with Batman despite his reputation. Everyone loves Dick. <laughs> 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 Grayson. I think mine, by sheer logic, must win. Because I was holding out for last. Because I actually, I did my homework. Rob studied this relentlessly with one hand in a tissue box. (laughs) No, I just used Kyle's hair. (laughs) You got that something about Mary thing going on. That's why you're wearing the hat. That's why it's always a little bit spiky. Yep. (laughs) So, Rob, what is your logical argument of comic book's best lover? Black Widow. Because, one, she is bisexual. So, she got the whole field down. Two. Okay. One of her specialities is seduction. So before she's before you're even in the bed with her, she can get you there mentally. Third, she is practicing all forms of sexual fun. So whatever you're into, and wait, she, is that comic canon? Wait, wait yes. Wait. I, I want to go. That makes sense the, as a femme fatale. Yep. I want to go to the University of Sexual Fun. <laughs> but yeah, so <laughs> and here's the thing: she will research you before she's even there, so she knows every little thing you like. So she can do whatever you want without you even knowing it. I started getting like a hyperventilating thing going on in my chest here. I think my heart may have stopped thinking about Sue, jo- Sue Johansson seducing me and <laughs> like, ah! And the final thing is I looked at what? postcoital panels, 
Meaning, I want to see how her partners look after every panel. They're satisfied. Granted, one more panel after that, they're, they're probably dead. But <laughs> we're not looking about what happens after. We're looking about best lover. And for that, I say... Black, Black Widow. Widow. Hold a tick. Megan, let's swing back to that comment there. <laughs> Sue Johansson. So oh, no, not Sue Johansson. <laughs> 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 hey, I do. <laughs> Sue Johansson is a very spectacular, upstanding woman, and she is amazing because she teaches the proper sexual education. <laughs> well, where do, you think, where do you think Black Widow learned it? <laughs> <laughs> From Sue Johansson. <laughs> what a I'm on Canadian television. <laughs> hey, I met that amazing woman. <laughs> so, so do you all concede to my my victory here? Come on. I I think I'm actually siding with Kyle here with Rick Sanchez. I'm gonna I'm gonna say Rick Sanchez too because as much as I'd like Black Widow, I don't know. Rick is just I would like. He's yeah. got that Ricksy business. Yeah, yeah I win. <clears throat> I would squanch Rick hard. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so every week we like to talk about what we've been up to this week. Uh, Rob, Rob, since you're beside me, how about you give us a start here? So I watched Colossal, the Anne Hathaway kaiju movie. So <laughs> I had heard about this movie before, and I was pretty excited for it. I unfortunately didn't get to, pay, to get to pay as much attention as I want to, but give us a little bit of the setup. So our movie opens with Anne Hathaway's character... Gloria getting kicked out of her boyfriend's apartment because she drinks way too much. So she decides to go back to her old hometown and just crash on her in her mom's old abandoned place, where she runs into an old elementary school friend, Oscar, played by Jason Sudeika. Sudeikis. Sudeikis, sorry. And she discovers that whenever she enters this uh, children's playground at, no at 8 o'clock, a uh, kaiju appears in Seoul, Korea. And does whatever she's doing. So if she's dancing, the kaiju's dancing. And then later through the movie, they discover that Oscar has the same power, except for he gets a giant robot. What are your feelings on this movie? My feelings are I thoroughly enjoyed it, but the advertisement was horrible because they pitched it as a lighthearted rom-com, which it is <laughs> not at all. This is not no. a rom-com, no. This, this is a slower movie set in a fantastical setting because it's very real people dealing with just what would be a regular relationship problem except they also control giant monsters when they're in a sandbox yes okay okay i have three major things wrong with this movie go that for it drove me insane okay number one i hate anne hathaway in it <gasps> oh wait do you mind that wait, like what? what about okay. it like bugs her bugs so you. during the entire movie i just i thought she was incredibly boring Compared to, like, the other people around her, minus that one random dude, I don't know his name. That does nothing to the movie? For he's, the movie? He's coming up, don't we worry. <laughs> so, I just feel like, during the entire pacing of it, she slowed it down. And, secondly, every... D okay. She's... She knows that she's slaughtering people in Seoul, Korea, right? Uh, after the first instance, yes. Yes. Now, she continues to drink once or twice after that, proceeds to do the same thing... And then the same thing happens where she goes, eh, the money, I suck, million people suck. You, she is drunk enough that she understands that what she's doing, but she doesn't stop her. Okay. Ever. The first two times they established that no fatalities were recorded. She fell on people. That's And after that time, she decides she's going to go one more time and write the apology letter and then, <laughs> and then never do it again. I'm sorry I squished you. But she you. does. Because robot guy keeps coming back and smushing people. She got shafted in the mar monster department too. He looks a thousand times cooler. She just looks like a weird uh, thirteen Cloverfield. No, I think it, it's supposed to be. In, in my head canon, it's the prequel to Pacific Rim. What? What? Kaiju versus Jaeger. Fair. Fair. <laughs> That's not bad. I actually liked her monster design though. It looked very. It, it, it reminded me of a tree ant, actually. It, it looked like very nature-based, just within its structure, within its facial features, and then it contrasted with like the super robotic one. It looks like a non-hunched-over version of the Cloverfield monster. Like, almost identical. Eh, I still so, like it. I so, don't okay. hate it, but I don't love it either, so I, I feel where Kyle's coming from. Now, the third glaring problem in the movie, 
the friend. Yes. He is the most useless thing in the movie. Now, Jason Sudeikis, being the wonderful actor that he is, he he understands that he has power now, right? And he's super hammered, drinking entire bottles of alcohol, and then he gets in the car and drives, but his friend goes with him in the passenger seat and doesn't say a word while he beats up Anne Hathaway, while he kills people, while he drinks and drives, while he burns down his bar, he does nothing. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. If it were any of you guys, um, you're getting hoofed as hard as I can. But the thing is, is like, doesn't this tell a little bit of a narrative about those friends that don't do anything? Like Correct. those those people who are like, you know, they're just like, I don't know what to do. I Th- there's just, bystanders. I'm just along for the ride. However, correct me if I'm wrong. Did she sleep with him? Yes, she did. Now, I that should mean a little bit more that there's some form of connection between these two. Yet he's just like. Eh, screw her. <laughs> yeah. Let her get, let her die. Did you ever think that maybe he felt like he couldn't? Because remember, Oscar said, "Am I gonna have to beat you up again?" Right at the beginning. So obviously, Joel has had his butt handed to him already by Oscar. So you know, yeah. maybe he's so afraid. Kill him. <laughs> yeah, but see, here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's one thing. Let's say, okay, let's say Kyle's been beating me up for a while, hypothetically. I mean, and, I've been beating up Kyle. Uh, that's that's. Fair. But let's just say. <laughs> And, like, I, I've just become really submissive to it. It's like, I don't want to get beat up anymore, whatever. But here's the thing. Kyle would have crossed a line with killing people and violently abusing a woman. I would be like, uh, no, th- that's it. I'm I'm fighting dirty. Hoop between the legs. I'm biting. I'm scratching. I'm doing whatever I can to mess you up. Like, just anything. Call the police, dude. Any boop, little boop. thing. Hey, uh... This guy I know is being really abusive to this woman. You pointed it out nine one one when he when he was getting ready to do the like the drunk driving to the park. When he got out of the vehicle, just take the keys out of the ignition. Take the keys. I don't know. Huck them into the forest where he can't find them. Who cares? He won't be driving then. Just hog tie him. Anything. <laughs> Hit him with the truck while he's out there. Yes, <laughs> I will admit that this character was annoying, frustrating, and useless. It just it drove me insane. <laughs> <laughs> but I, get, I think I saw in this could just be, be me reading too deep. This was a movie that used its an uh, allegory for abusive relationships. Like the guy when he's talking about it's like, oh, you're going to drink this because if you don't, I'm going to go take a walk in the park. He actually shows a lot of like certain things where he brings her food and couches and brings her all the things to live off of and then flips it when she tries to get away. So in, no, I've no. given you all of these things, and you're just spitting in my face here. How dare you do that? Absolutely. It's, oh, so to me, angry. this is an allegory for that kind of relationship. It very well could be. And the monsters are physical representations of what they are inside. He's cold, robotic, doesn't care about life like a machine. She, she's more natural looking, like more like a tree creature. She actually does care. Today on Film Theory. <laughs> Now, the, uh, the director here, I-, I remembered him solely because of his credits in one of my favorite movies that I will never shut up about, ABCs of Death. This is Nacho Vigalondo. He actually did the first segment, A is for Apocalypse and ABCs of Death. You're welcome, Andrew. Yes, Kyle is the one that introduced me to this movie, and I have been its apostle ever since. But I believe this is his first uh, like full-length feature movie, because everything else that I've seen has been primarily like shorts. He was also in VHS Virals. He did the parallel monster sketch with like the portal there. Yeah, and this is a good movie. It's shot well, acted well. I know you think it's a little slow at moments, but I, I can't call it a bad movie. The big thing for me is... The advertisement was wrong. Honestly, I'd give it like a solid 6 out of 10, maybe. That's still fair. No, yeah, I agree with you there. Now, when it comes to advertising, that's something that always frustrates myself and a lot of people. But on the flip side, I understand it because a lot of times a movie can be fantastic. But if you sell the movie straight, you will just... I get a lot of like the normies quote unquote to tune out so what they'll do is they'll tune a trailer to what they think will get the most butts in seats and that's when we see a lot of movies get misrepresentative and I've been pulling back a lot from trailers lately like after I've seen the first one and I'm committed to the movie I'm worried about getting too much information to build up an idea in my head what it's going to be about and then I can't accept what it is about and 
it's a marketing issue. I understand that at the end of the day, movies are there to inherently make money. So whatever they think makes the most money is the way they're going to advertise it, but it doesn't account for quality as great movies could be advertised terribly and then do nothing. On that note, we're going to head to our first break here, folks. Guys, thank you so much for tuning into Thunder Geeks, brought to you by 102.7 FM, C-I-L-U, or around the world at luradio.ca. We're your Thunder Geeks, and we'll be right back. And we're back! You're listening to Thunder Geeks, brought to you by 102.7 FM, C-I-L-U, or around the world at luradio.ca. Of course, welcome back to Thunder Geeks, guys. If you want to take a peek into the studio, you can do so on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash thundergeekspeak. Very particular reason I was playing that song. Of course, it is the theme song to Back Mongolian Chop Squad. I've discovered this anime by accident years ago, as I think a lot of, I found out a lot of people did, just flipping through channels, and suddenly I saw, like, oh, there's a cartoon on, and it's on much music. And they were doing a marathon of every episode of the dubbed version of uh, of Beck in its entirety, just one after the other. And I'm just like, okay, well, this is my entire day today. And I never knew at what point I ever tuned into the, the show until I went back later. It turns out I missed about three minutes. But Beck Mongolian Chop Squad is the story of uh, pretty much creating a band and going through the trials and tribulations and trying to build uh, yourself up from the bottom. But what the, I watched this week is a couple years back, they did a live action movie version of this. And I had been hoping to watch it for a very long time, but I had trouble tracking it down. And then I forgot about it entirely until recently when music was more on my brain due to certain movies about guardian the galaxy. Guardian? <laughs> guardian, guardianing. I'm going to add my own. Uh, Gardeners the galaxy. Yeah, it's like Gardeners, Gardeners the of galaxy. the galaxy. <laughs> yes, yes, there's just going to be plants and beauty everywhere. You make a hole and then you put it in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> but they did a an okay job at adapting this show, but there's a lot that got cut off. Some of it works, some of it doesn't. But the main cast is really what's the focus here. So you have your main character, Koyuki. Uh, he is this, you know, average 14-year-old, and for him, he is introduced to Ryusuke, who opens it up to the world of rock music, where before he just had a boring life, and Ryusuke gives him a guitar and says, you know, if you want to start learning, you want to start playing, you know, here you go, and Koyuki becomes obsessed. He starts practicing nonstop, just trying to learn how to play. And then you have Ryusuke. He is the the leader of the band that eventually becomes Beck. Ryusuke is a Japanese kid that grew up in America, so he speaks both English and Japanese. And when he was young, uh, he stole this guitar with his friend, uh, Eddie, who went on to become this huge music sensation. It's a guitar called Le Seal. It's uh, Les Paul, and it just has a bunch of bullet holes in it. They reproduced it for the live-action movie. It looks beautiful in person. And then, of course, you have Chiba. He's your MC. He's the, the rapper of the group. And he is fun, he's brash, and he is very excitable. And he's always down for a fight. Uh, <laughs> one of the big uh, early moments you get uh, with Chiba is him coming in to beat up all of Koyuki's bullies who have been, you know, harassing him and actually broke his guitar. Then you have Tyra, the bassist. He doesn't have as much focus in the movie as he did in the show, but there isn't too much you need to know other than he looks great with his shirt off. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally you have Saki. He is uh, Koyuki's schoolmate, and he plays the drums for, uh, for them. And again, another character doesn't get that much focus in the movie, but it works for the story the movie's telling. Some of the things that got cut out, though, were some of the side characters I really liked and some of the situations that I really liked from the anime. The main one, the main sacrifice being Mr. Saito. Mr. Saito was Koyuki's music teacher, and after the guitar originally gets broken, it doesn't get repaired, Mr. Saito lends him his uh, White Falcon and then starts teaching Koyuki how to, how to play. But on top of that, he also starts making Koyuki start swimming to increase his lung capacity to make him a better singer. Which brings me to my number one issue with this movie. Every time, so the entire like basis of this show is music, is you know being in a band and the rise of this Japanese kid Koyuki who sings amazingly in English despite not understanding a word. 
every single time they open up for Koyuki to go sing, just mutes his voice. You get subtitles of what he's saying, but he doesn't <laughs> sing the entire freaking time, and it drove me nuts. I thought they were just saving it for the climax, we'll get it at the very end. No, nothing. You never get to see him sing, and the only thing I can think of, despite the casting in this movie being perfect, the characters they have look like the characters in the anime to a creepy degree. I can only think they hired someone who couldn't sing, and that bugged me a lot. Couldn't they just dub him? That's what I would think, and that's what I would hope. Now, have you guys have you guys ever seen Beck? No. I love it. I have the box set, the entirety of it. You have no idea how much I'm in love with this show. So, I mean, do you have a favorite moment from it or anything? Or You get in there, and you kick that fish's butt! <laughs> Chiba is my favorite character from the entire show because he's so energetic and crazy and fun and he's really low drama honestly I mean he's a good character he's, he's just, such a chill guy yeah he's like the ultimate friend of just like hey guys let's get our stuff together and we'll just we'll go sing we'll do a performance it'll be awesome let's just go do it yeah so with the movie it pretty much ca- covers the the first season of uh, well the only season of Beck and I'm a little disappointed they never set it up for a sequel. As painful as that can be sometimes, Beck did go beyond what we had within the series because after they play this music festival, well, against all odds, they're put on this tiny sound stage. they're up against two much bigger acts, and Ryusuke made a deal to get on that stage that if they don't pull a bigger audience than stage one and two, that they will quit. They will disband and Ryusuke will work for the evil record producer who is kind of like this Shug Knight allegory to me <laughs> where yeah he's he's no nonsense uh at what he's the one that uh Ryusuke stole his guitar from and when he finds out he kidnaps Ryusuke beats the ever-loving crap out of him and then just holds a gun to his head and was going to kill him except the original owner of Lucille uh oh, I was Sonny Lee Dave? No, it wasn't Sonny, but it was this old uh, blues musician. Negan? Not Negan, not <laughs> Negan. Just gets to play with Yusuke for a while, and they decide to let him live. But what happened beyond this, uh, it's a really good story because they actually go to America, and they get to tour the States as a completely unknown band now because they've built up their reputation in Japan, but they go to the States where rock music, you know, where they've looked up to for so long, and they're playing in dive bars, no one really knows who they are, and Ryusuke is missing, so they're learning to try to play as a band without the heart and soul that they've had the entire time. Though, my favorite moment, and unfortunately we'll never hear a song for it, is it happens with the friend I referenced with you, Ry- Ryusuke, uh, Eddie. He's in this band called Dying Breed, and he is he's already achieved his dreams and that's what Yurisuke was striving for is one day I'm gonna be on your level and we're gonna jam together so Eddie is killed Uh, I won't spoil too much but he does eventually die but he was writing a song right before he died and the only person who ever got to hear it was Koyuki and he is then pretty much has to take the mantle to 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 finish this song and I wish we could hear it because the music in the anime was so fantastic. In the movie, mm, not as good. Evolution was a pretty cool song. That was the main one they were pushing the entire time. But to some of the other songs they had in the, the anime, Follow Me, uh, Moon on the Water, a lot of them like rather weren't there or would have been there in some sort of version but koyuki never sings <laughs> yeah it's just it's it's so sad that he didn't actually sing throughout the entire thing it's a bizarre choice to make when it's a music movie it's about a band and you're gonna have a character whose main trait he's known for is his amazing singing ability they just have everything mute and everyone just stares there and just stares and oh like oh he's so amazing and good and it's nothing coming through so i mean so like is I, the music still playing in the background and he's just not singing yes or? he's just moving his lips and nothing comes out so you're talking about yourself now yeah, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I I wanted to like this movie so much, and when it comes to the characterization and it comes to 
how like the actual story it works but if you fail on the music i just can't recommend it it really let me down in that sense so the only thing i know about beck and the only question i have is the pupper in it the dog is in it and the dog looks pretty close but he isn't that frankenstein sewn together dog with like the blue patch over his eye but he's still this is like the closest you can get to having it as a real dog without putting a whole bunch of like no, 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 no. Have you seen what the Japanese can do with CGI? Ryuk in the Death Note movies was amazing. <laughs> they could have made amazing CGI pupper that looked all Frankenstein-y. They were lazy. Also, wasn't there a bird? Didn't didn't Mr. Saito have a bird? Mr. Saito had a bird. Yeah. They ended up giving him to Ryusuke. And there's only one little scene where you see Ryusuke starting to play and the bird starts rapping over it. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Yeah, I remember being, like, 16 when this show started coming up on on, uh, on Much Music. And it was so awesome because I had been coming here or going to Manitowaj every single time to watch anime. And that was, like, the highlight. And when I was flipping through the channels and I saw that Beck Mongolian Chop Squad was starting to play on Much Music, I obviously pulled a Megan Fangirl moment and <laughs> had a seizure on the floor. So, yeah. And I was so obsessed with this show. And I just... I really wish I would have rewatched it before you watch this show or this movie so I could talk more about it. It's definitely worth it. If you've never finished off the manga, I would really recommend doing that because the story just gets more intense and it it makes you wish for more of the anime but it's still a very satisfying conclusion by the end of it because the uh the tour is pretty much turned into a clip show in the end credits <coughs> but megan how about you what have you been up to this week i've played video games I I finally got around to playing something. Um, I've been wanting to play it for a while. I was looking through um, Andrew's collection, and I saw a cover of one Alan Wake, and I thought it looked really cool, so I decided to play it. Why don't you just let Alan sleep? <laughs> um, I have it, it's um it's not a it's not a good game. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I've never, uh, but I'm enjoying playing it. It's just, it's got certain. It, it has interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I got I an eight point five out of ten. I just look it up and I'm like, oh yeah, nine on Steam, nine on IGN. So that means nothing. An eight point five and ten are the game spot. I'm like, what? Yeah, um, it's actually not horrible. It's not good, but it's not horrible either. Okay, so some of the... Okay, I'll set up the game for you first here. How's that sound? Um, Alan Wake is a writer. He's an author. He's published many books. He's famous. He has an amazing apartment in New York. Ah! See, that's the most unrealistic part of this game already, <laughs> is that a writer is able to afford an apartment in New York. Yeah, and his wife's a photographer. <laughs> oh. Hold on, no, he's a best-selling writer. Yeah, so no. he could probably afford an apartment. Yeah, some of his uh, titles, some of his titles involve um, a character named Alex something. I don't remember. <laughs> Anyways, more on that later. Alex or Alan? Sorry, Alan is having a bit of writer's block. I don't know why, but he's really in a bad mood, and he is going on vacation. He's taking some R and R, um, probably. Um, told to him by his producer what do they call that editor publisher. publisher his publisher his manager they're like hey you've been slacking you need to write a book here go on vacation so he ends up going back to a place called bright falls which is his hometown or i don't know it's just this place out in the out in the woods it's a woodsy mountain town so it's nice um straight off the hop Alan is just rude to every person. I do not like Alan at all as a character. He's awful. They go to this cabin. Um, they were supposed to get to the keys from uh, some guy named Stucky. But some creepy old lady... Stucky? Yeah, his name is Stucky. Not kidding. His name is Stucky. That's it. <laughs> um, some creepy old woman wearing all black <laughs> and a veil is like, uh, here's, the, here's the keys to the cabin. <laughs> Um, Sounds nice. Yeah, this this sh this this game is the story is all over the place, and I just there are people that are possessed by the darkness, and you have to kill them because do they believe in a thing called love? No, no, no. Hold on. Yeah, no, you have to kill them 
with, with a your flashlight. flashlight. So light makes uh, the darkness around these um, creatures fade away. Just <laughs> like Howie Mandel in Little Monsters. <laughs> oh my god, can... this is a video game version of Little Monsters? <laughs> I'm out. Nope, done. No, I'm 100% in. I want to go to the Magic Bed Fortress. Yeah. It's very heavily uh, influenced by horror novels, obviously. There's references to um, The Shining, uh, etc. Um, yeah. Here's Johnny. Yes, actually. Never in the book. In the beginning, some guy tries to axe down the cabin door, and he references The Shining right away. He's like, oh, if I don't get out of here soon, I'm going to be ended up axed by Jack. Uh, <laughs> I, I hate to sound hipster here, but in the book, it wasn't an axe. It was a roke mallet. Huh. Yeah. The, uh, okay. To our listeners, if you've ever known there's a Stephen King miniseries based on The Shining, it's terrible, but it's literally word for word of what the book is. Yeah. Um so each each little episode this 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 game plays out like a Netflix original series. Oh. Yeah. So that's one of the cool things about it. It literally does. It literally does. The way that it the way that it's set up. It's his book. It's his book. You're following the pages, the pages in his book. In his book. <laughs> literally pick up the page the and manuscript read pages. the story that's coming in front I'm of you. Getting there. <laughs> Yeah, so each episode plays like a Netflix original series. It's st- like it starts, you do all the missions, you go through the story, you pick up manuscript pages, you listen to him read them to you or you can read them yourself, whatever you want. And then at the end of the at the end of the episode, quote unquote, um it it's all cool. There's music and then there's a recap of like or a preview of like the next episode. So it's really interesting as you as you play, you pick up manuscript pages, it helps you get like some more inside um information about what's going on in the story sort of thing and the best part the best the best part is you pick up a manuscript page from one of uh alan wake's previous novels oh and the person that reads it to you is 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 max Payne. oh that's why you like it (laughs) it's literally james mccaffrey Mark Wahlberg? No, not Mark Wahlberg. Guys, I found some pain. It's not. (laughs) It's James McCaffrey, and he's reading these pages to you. But the fun... Okay, the best part about it is the story that Alan Wake has written is not even his own material. So James McCaffrey, Max Payne, is not even reading new material. He's literally just reading Max Payne. (laughs) Well, I mean, does that mean that Max Payne is, in fact, a novel? Uh, Max Payne's a comic book series. It was a comic book series before it was a game. Really? I didn't know that. That's I- why I'm trying to get my hands on some of the comic books. Ooh. Yeah, I only ever played the first game, and I got really frustrated on that point where the floor <laughs> kept changing and disappearing. I'm like, no! I hate everything, and this has spooky music. I am done. If Macon wants help getting comic books, you know I got connections in the comic book <laughs> industry. Well, not in the industry, in the local community. I was going to be like, what? Support your local comic book shop. So it has really clunky game mechanics, unfortunately. So, like, the combat system is terrible. Oh. It's literally so repetitive over and over again. Shine your flashlight. Shoot, shoot. Shine your flashlight. Shoot, shoot. Use a flare. Use a flare gun. Use a big gun. Um, there's actually this one thing that I like about it, too, is that uh, there's televisions laid around the, uh, the entirety of Bright Falls, and you can turn them on, and like a little Twilight Zone episode spoof <laughs> plays. <laughs> literally! Yeah. Literally, it's acted out by re- pe- real people, and then in it's In a small over. town in the middle of Ontario, <laughs> the six people in a studio think they're in for a fun show, but that's when things got weird. Damn it, Rob! (laughs) You set me up. You set me up. That's entirely my fault. I walked into (sighs) that one. Another thing is uh, there's also radios strewn around the town, so you can turn them on. And uh, DJ, you know, a a host starts talking, taking calls, plays some music. And then it gets really similar to Silent Hill Downpour at this point. I've also played Silent Hill Downpour, and everyone's like, they're not similar. Yes, they are. They're exactly the same thing. And, yeah, they have the same feel, same sort of vibe with the music and the radios and just how the game is played. So, Megan, you, you said you can't, you're you in on this game. So is this like a you wouldn't buy, but it would be like a solid rent from Blockbuster? If Blockbuster still exists, would you touch this game or you tell people to skip it? I got it for free! <laughs> so, I'm playing it. I'm going to continue playing it. I'm going to finish it. I like this game, but I'm like, I'm saying it's not a good game. So, Mickey won't even blockbuster this game. She's going to say, <laughs> go to your friend's library shelf of, hey, I'm going to borrow this. 
I bought Silent Hill Downpour, and I really enjoyed it, and I liked it. It was it was a little repetitive and stuff, but the story was a little bit more vast and stuff, and that's why I like this game, too, is because the story, there's lots of stuff to find, there's more story. I just like the story. I just like stories. Yeah. So, Kyle, what about you? What have you been up to this week? See, <clears throat> one of the games I've played for a very long time, Heroes of the Storm, <laughs> basically um, a MOBA, but it's... Every franchise in the Blizzard universe gets sucked into this. Now, they decided, hey, we're going to revamp the entire game. Oh. So they added HOTS 2.0, Heroes of the Storm 2.0. So right off the bat, they gave us a cinematic, and it was absolutely beautiful. In the Hanamura map of Overwatch, they had Diablo fighting Genji, and then D.Va flies in, and you see all like the characters fighting and things like that. So they decided, hey, let's add Hanamura as a map. Oh. So you actually play the Hanamura area. You have to ex- escort the payload, which nobody goes on the payload. <laughs> <laughs> Drives me insane. <laughs> Please. And Just shit on it. They started this uh, event, too. It was, it was the Nexus Quest. They wanted you to play uh, five games a week with your friends, and you got rewards in Heroes of the Storm and Overwatch. Loot boxes which they added as well. Just like in Overwatch, you open it, gives you skins, voiceovers. Uh, they added announcers. Emojis were added. Thanks, Blizzard. And just everything like that. And it was, all, it was awesome for uh, veteran players like myself. Um, they gave us uh, veteran boxes, which was guaranteed a legendary skin or mount, and it was guaranteed, you know, pretty much awesome things. They, uh, with launch 2, they added two new champions, uh, Genji from Overwatch and Cassia, a Diablo 2 Javazon. Oh. So with Genji being in the game, instead of harassing Ma- Mercy all the time, he's going to be harassing who now? Well, up to anybody. Lucio's in it. Is Hantho in the game? Yeah, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Gross. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> but, but yeah, like for myself, I'm. they added player level, so every... I don't know. I think level you get on a character adds up, and I wound up being level 213 or something like that. Hi. Um, which gave me like 60 something loot boxes. <laughs> so I sat there opening them and getting all these fun free things and legendaries and characters. And what Blizzard did as well was they added four mega packs. Ooh. So the mega packs were either tank, specialist, uh, a mixture, or assassin. And I want the sassy in. They gave you one for free, one of the bo- boosts for free. It was 20 champions out of that bundle. So they gave you a, a huge list of characters that you could play as. I wound up taking the assassin bundle because I only had three or four. It, but it was it was really awesome. Um, basically, the story behind Heroes of the Storm, though, is... Uh, so there's an area. It's called the Nexus. Yes. And, and people from all universes started getting sucked in. Uh, kind of like Mortal Kombat. Yeah, pretty much like Mortal Kombat. Oh. So there was uh, Diablo, StarCraft, and Warcraft were the first three to be added, of course. They have the Lost Vikings. <gasps> yes, I'm 100% in, so... Now... Sequel's the best game. Lost Vikings with their upgrades? Actually, oh. Andrew... Oh. Originally, the leveling system was you leveled the characters 1 to 10. Yes. 10 gave you a master skin that you could buy. Nice. Now, the Lost Vikings master skin was a little bit neon and armored. Lost Vikings 2, the greatest game that Blizzard has ever made in the history of their entire company. Yeah, the only Blizzard game I've ever played through, and I love it! That's fair. Now, <laughs> I'm not going to get into this argument. So, you might like the other skin that they have. They have a pajama party skin. <gasps> I love pajamas. Does any of them have a footy? They're all in onesies. Yes. <laughs> and they run around and they you do everything with them. And with this as well, they gave you just everything you needed to play and like boost with your friends and all this stuff. You get more experience playing with friends. Uh, there's more reward systems and it's it's more accessible now. Okay, that, that was my question because I suck at MOBAs. I have tried... And I can't. I am awful. So would this be a good jumping on point for me, or am I still a hopeless loser? No, honestly, if you if you wanted to, it's free, obviously. What you can do is there's a game mode called Versus AI. Oh, you okay, so you can practice. From beginner all the way up to veteran. Like, there's super, super hard AIs that can be on there. 
if you don't like that, you can go to quick play, which doesn't actually affect your score. You still get levels and all of that. Okay, I have an isolated gamer question. What's a mo MOBA? <laughs> <laughs> Multiplayer Online Battle Arena. So, essentially, the game is there's one base or a second base, and you have to try to destroy each other's bases. Yep. Normally, it's three lanes, and minions just keep spawning constantly, like little <laughs> basically fodder. And you pick a sponge character, and you go through the level, then you beat the level, start again. You pick a different character, you pick the same character. Get a different map, Beep. I have a question. Shoot. So how come in Heroes of the Storm, Zarya's costumes are amazing, that is but in Overwatch, they're terrible? What is that? What so is Why? What? One of the biggest out things in Heroes of the Storm right now is that a huge flooding of people from Overwatch came and started playing. Thank you all for the leveling fodder. I love it. <laughs> now, like pr point and proven, I played Valera with uh, our friend Cash, right? Yeah. I went 49 and 1. Damn. Yeah. On my first game back. <laughs> so it was fun. So on that note, folks, we're going to head to our next break here. Of course, thank you so much for tuning in to Thunder Geeks, brought to you by 102.7 FM, C-I-L-U, or around the world at L-U Radio dot C-A, for your <laughs> Thunder Geeks, and we'll be right back. And we're back. You're listening to Thunder Geeks, brought to you by 102.7 FM, C-I-L-U, or around the world at L-U Radio dot C-A. Welcome back to the show here, guys. So rolling right along here... Leisha, how about you? What have you been up to this week? I watched a series on Netflix that's been bugging me to watch it since it came out. Mm. Netflix was like, watch, watch it. Watch, watch it. Watch, watch it. this. And you know what? Netflix was right. I did want to watch it and did watch it. Netflix knows you better than you know yourself. Oh, it does. It's scary. Um, but anyway, the show I watched was called Girl Boss. And that was the one reason why I was kind of against it. I was like, that sounds like a dumb name. It's very <laughs> straightforward, but it really isn't about a girl boss it's about really being your own boss i've seen a majority of the series so far but i haven't finished it off yet so basically the how we're introduced to it is and how the description is it's like this is ba this is loosely based on true events real loose so and that's fair it is based on S sophia amoruso's book but slash it's her autobiography called hashtag girl boss <laughs> And it's pretty much how she became her own boss of her own company, like million dollar company. So as we start out with Sophia, she is, lives in San Francisco. She has a pretty crap life. I mean, at least she has a car. Well, I mean, she she comes off as, you know, your stereotypical. I mean, how I think they portray stereotypical millennials is like, you know, she's really lazy at her job. She's not really committed to it. She's more concerned about doing her own thing. She didn't have respect for her boss, doesn't drive, and she's just kind of drifting through life. Yeah, but that's <laughs> that's the yes, boy. She is 23 when we meet her, and that's how most people end up when they're out of college. They're like, no, now what the hell do I do? So what ends up happening one day is just she ends up getting fired from her job because, well, she hates it. And she's like, well, this is dumb. I don't want to work for you. And she's just rummaging through one of her vintage stores and she finds this really beautiful jacket. And this is where we start to get introduced to, like, the true Sophia because she negotiates her way to this jacket to only pay $9 for it. And she knows what it's worth. It's a beautiful vintage 1970s East West jacket, pristine condition. She's like, you know what? I paid $9 for it. Stick it on eBay. Let's see if I can, you know, get some money. I just lost my job. Let's see if we can flip it. She wakes up in the morning and the jacket sold for $600. See, and I could relate to that quite a bit because this is what I've been doing with uh, video game consoles and games for years, ever since I was 17 and I had my own job and my own income. I realized a lot of this stuff, I mean, I wanted, so I started buying it for myself, but then I started getting lots and realized, wow, some of these things I'm buying way below what they're actually worth. So then I just turn around, I was flipping it on eBay or I was flipping it on uh, like like the buy and sell groups and or Kijiji and just making money and supplementing my income. So after she flips this jacket, she decides, hey, this could be my life. All I did was take a couple pictures, 
Because as we see, she's scrolling through eBay and she's like, well, no wonder this stuff's not selling. You're taking crap pictures of it. It looks stupid. And one thing that they don't put into the show, she actually has a background in photography. She did go to school for it for a little bit, but she dropped out. Oh. So that's why her stuff starts standing out because she knows how to take pictures. Yeah, I wish they would have uh, focused on that a little bit as well because, I mean, (coughs) that was one of the things that I liked about it is the reason she succeeded was presentation and marketing. Yeah, and one thing I really like about Sophia is even though she's the main character, she's not inherently like an ideal role model or necessarily even a good person because in the first episode, she decides, you know, I need to sell this jacket. She just up and steals this area rug off the street and just walks away and the shop owner's like, are you going to, you're going to, I know, okay, you're not going to pay for that. Have a good day. And I think that's a main, that's an important thing to have for main characters, and especially, I'm going to say, female characters. That's a criticism that a lot of people will give. It's like, oh, they don't give them any character flaws. Sophia has character flaws, and that's what makes her interesting. She isn't a perfect person. She does steal sometimes. She rips people off for her own benefit. But she's very business savvy and smart, and that's what ends up making her succeed, despite all these other shortcomings. So the series kind of, you know, after we discover this is her purpose, she's going to flip clothes, as she says that people flip houses, she flips clothes. Yes. We kind of go through her journey of starting up on eBay, discovering her name, starting to sell her stuff. So a couple things that we come across in one of the first episodes is she sold a bridal dress, which obviously the customer ruined and you know she's like i don't want a bad review i'm gonna fix this and this is really minor in this episode but one thing i really liked is there's a countdown timer kind of like so many hours to the wedding and we get to this point where she has so many minutes to the wedding and that's one people's criticism when you have timers right is it never (laughs) actually represents what's happening this actually counts down fully from two minutes until she delivers the dress so it was small but i really liked that detail uh the other one and I don't, I don't want to call her a favorite character and call her an interesting character is Gail. And Gail is another seller of vintage clothing online. However, she has a very different approach to it. She's like, yes, we want to preserve it and save it and treasure it for people to come. Let's make it clear. She is your internet commentator. She has a forum of her own friends that are, you know, dedicated to vintage clothing. And it's kind of a snapshot of just the early 2000 and forum culture there where you'd get some people who were particularly obsessed very knowledgeable but if you ever met them offline it's like there's something a little weird about you and the one of my favorite episodes is when gail comes down on a bus from reno to talk reno to talk to sophia about what she's doing is wrong because sophia's taking these clothing and she's sometimes changing them cutting them up stuff like that to sell desecrating these works of art exactly but she's like this is what my customer wants and we go through this heartwarming tale of, you know, they're together and they they go out to the bar drinking. They start to know each other and they see a dress in the shop that Sophia originally got her jacket from. And, you know, you, you think they've bonded. And in the end, Gail leaves her the dress. The very end of the episode, Sophia cuts up that dress and flips it. And Gail is peeved. And I, I love that part because you thought you knew where it was going to go. And it was like, nope. And it changed it. It, it. it made it think that, you know, oh, okay, Sophia was going to be a completely different person now. But in the end, no, she what she loves doing is redesigning clothes and especially selling them and making the profit from them. And because that's what sparked is she got a message saying, like, oh, do you have any homecoming dresses? And that's when, you know, she's like, oh, I have this idea. Boom, boom, boom. Done. And exactly, and it it busts that female perspective of she, you know, they may not go as far as they need to for business, and Sophia does. Absolutely. And I like the journey that we go through is she also, like, the other things, like, you got up to the part where she couldn't get rental space because she had bad credit. Even though she's like, here's three months cash rent, they still don't trust her because the person renting thinks she's a girl. Yeah. (laughs) Not responsible. So uh, b- before I want to, I want to take a slight note there. One of my favorite characters was her neighbor, and that was pl- uh, who was her neighbor played by Mama Ru. Ru Paul Charles. I've been liking that I've been seeing uh, him pop up in a lot more things. I saw him pop in Animals lately, and now within Girl Boss. I hope this is uh, pushing things uh, to a, like a higher, more mainstream uh, level for him. Yeah, absolutely. That was one thing that hooked me. Like, I kind of played it, whatever. I was just watching it. Then I heard Rue's voice, and I was like, sit I'm down. In. Sit down, pay attention. Rue plays a TSA agent, kind of like her sounding board and stuff like that. So I'm going to say 
my favorite part of the series is how they decided to portray internet conversation on screen. I haven't gotten to that part yet. Okay, so the two big ones they show is uh, the internet, the, the forum, as you call it. So they're actually all sitting around a round table in a black room with just like the white light. And how they're speaking is how people used to post on forums. <laughs> uh, Angrily. <laughs> so if someone was typing in all caps, that person would be screaming. And as they're sitting at the round table, they all have like their, their username on there. <laughs> And there's just this one character where she's like, she would type something and then she'd be like, to shop times and treasures, please click here. Because she would link every time in her own post to her own site. <laughs> in her signature. Exactly. <laughs> just a short comment on that before we move into Guardians here. That's something that I've actually noticed between uh, like uh, uh, where people started on the internet, where they started typing. For people who started you know, interacting through chat and text predominantly, they'll send like a thousand little messages. For people who started off on like forums and like BBS boards, they'll type everything in one coherent thought and they'll send a text wall. And it's something that seems to hold pretty true as I've, as I've, uh, as, and sometimes I use that for my advantage in debates where I notice where people are giving me 5,000 little things. I'm like, I can tell you're mad now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the other one they portray is IMs, and they portray it completely opposite, where it's completely white, and it's just the two people sitting on chairs talking to each other, and they talk completely in monotone because you, you don't understand someone's tone when you're talking on Messenger like that. So... That's an that's an interesting technique to use. That really stood out for me. Um, the low point of the episode is near the end. She does go and visit her mom, who we find out has been like an absent mother character like that. Oh, I feel like I'm getting spoilery here. No, I mean honestly, I don't see the ep- I don't think the episode did anything. Maybe I missed it. I just I when I, I watched this twice and I just skipped that episode the second time. <laughs> so the one thing that I'm really interested in, because again, it is based on Sophia's life. Yes. This is only part of it. They only get up to the the launch of her brand essentially. In real life, Nasty Gal has went bankrupt last year. Oh dang. So I really want a season two to see if they kind of go from like, oh look, she made it all the way to what happened, why, and why did this crash? What year did this come out? Do we do? Was it this year? Or? Like the girl boss? Yeah. Oh, it came out like two weeks ago. Okay, okay. So they released this after the brand had already crashed. Yeah, like it was in development before it happened because this is set in two thousand and six, and that's yes. one thing I like. It kind of throws to Kimmy, Kimmy Schmidt a little bit. Where it kind of puts in those 2006 things, because that's where it's set. You know what scares me? That 2000 nostalgia is coming up right quick, and then I'm going to feel super old as my <laughs> 90s nostalgia is like, oh, what are you talking about? Oh, man. Yeah, there was little things in there that you don't realize are like 10, 12 years old, and you're like, oh, yeah, we don't say that anymore. Um, but definitely check it out. Like I said, I watched it, and like I binge watched it in one night, and then just a couple days later, I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna watch it again for the show, and I fully paid attention to it the second time as well. Ooga chaka, ooga 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 chaka, ooga 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 chaka, ooga. Someone else sing because I can't. Chaka, ooga. Oh, I can't stop this feeling. Ooga chaka. Deep inside of me. Ooga ooga chaka. Girl, you just don't realize what you do to me. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 is finally come out. Wow, man, I've been waiting for this movie for so long. The first movie blew me away to the point where I went to see it four times. And I don't do that for movies that aren't Star Wars. It. Did, I, did you even do it for Star Wars, though? Yes. I, okay, for uh, for Force Awakens, yes. Rogue One, no. Episode 8, we'll find out. Guardians of the Galaxy blew me away. It was the first Marvel movie that I got to go into as a total just, I don't know, I don't know any of these characters. I have not seen them in other media. I'm going in completely fresh. So I get to experience a Marvel movie for the first time with no preconceived notions of what I should see on screen, and it blew me away. <laughs> So I'm, I was so excited for this movie to come out, and I'm curious what you guys thought of it, and especially like our new characters that are introduced. I loved it. And I, now there's three different actors and guardians I've gotten to meet. I definitely think it was probably one of the best movies I've seen in a very long time. All right, so I'm terrible, and I still have not watched the first one. I am sorry. <laughs> You've seen the second one, but you haven't watched the first one yet. True. But what struck me as I was watching this movie as an entirety, I was like, where is my game of this? The, the, I feel like I am watching an RPG. Isn't there a Telltale? Actually, yes. The Telltale game just came out a few weeks ago. Nice! 
But yeah, for me, I'm like, here's my side quests. Here's my main objective. Here's the... I want it! Uh, but when you were saying, you know how you got the first one was introduced to you, you had no idea who the characters were or anything like that? For me, I get to go through with the games, and they've Rocket has been in a, hundreds of games from Marvel. Nice. And so I... He's my favorite. <laughs> Understand. I'm curious, who is everyone's favorite guardian? Rocket. Rocket and Groot. The two work best as a comedic duo. It's Drax. I, I'm with Megan. I just, well, I love Drax. He's just so blunt and hilarious. <laughs> I guess so. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm the, Megan. Uh, I'll be the boring one here. A uh, Star Lord. From, from the opening scene of the first movie, being alone on a planet, kicking on tunes, and dancing around, that is exactly my plan when we get to, you know, it, get to explore space, is I want to dance on every planet. Fair enough, and he's pretty... It's, it's Chris Pratt. Yes. It's, it's Chris Pratt as a character. No, and he got so hot for this role. To be fair, he was still cute as a chubby guy. Okay, but I mean, then you get Marvel abs, and it's like, oh, man. Parks and Rec, Chris Pratt is still my favorite. I don't know who Marvel is hiring for their, like, personal trainers for all these people, but I need me some hookups. Do more crunches. Crunch. Crunch. Megan, I think your name has to be Chris to get one of those. True. I'm... Oh, no! <laughs> Tripod! <laughs> Tripod's the only one getting the Marvel Marvel <laughs> personal trainer. I'm just trying to picture him with abs, and I just physically can't do it. We can draw them on. <laughs> Megan, you have artistic skills. We'll just draw on abs for... Oh, let me get my contour. <laughs> Now, I'm curious, uh, which movie do you think is better? Uh, do you think the first one's better or the sequel's better? I'll let Kyle go first because I can see him rubbing his hands. Okay. Now, I know we had a little bit of this discussion before. Yes, we, we put, put a pin in this. We're like, oh, we disagree here. I want, I'm curious about how this plays out on air. I believe the second one is better. Really? Yes. Okay, because for me, the first one showed me so many new things, and that's what sucked me in. And for this one... It felt like they were doing a lot of things because it was in the first movie, but it didn't feel as integrated or well thought out. Like, music was in this movie, but I didn't have a scene like uh, I had with, like, the opening, where we're just like, okay, this is, you know, he's dancing around, and it feels like an integral part of the plot. It's tied in in the end with uh, with his mother. The second one, I'm just, I, I that's one thing that a little bit really? bugged me. Yeah, really? You didn't get any of the songs from that? The, the cat, cat Stevens, son and father. Okay, the entire theme that, of the movie is a father figure. That one thematically works. That Hold one, on, thematically I got works. more. Okay, so Kurt Russell uses the lyrics from the song word for word to describe the entire situation. Yes, like that. That's how their music is being used in this. Okay, he's that's fair. He's using them as perfect as it is. Mr. Blue Sky playing in the beginning, showing Groot as a natural young child running around while things are happening. That was my favorite part of the movie in the sense that that was the best way to not have to show a fight scene while kind of showing a fight scene. I love the theme, like the, the theme here with just fatherdom because that's the big thing here is you get to meet Kurt Russell. Uh, I, get, I think we'll keep his character name under wraps here to not give away too but much. But I want to say one thing, not reveal anything about his character. The du- Whoever was CG de-aging Kurt Russell in that movie, oh my god! That's amazing. They're getting really good at making actors look young. Oh, okay. We're going to get to that BoJack series where we just have them scan their face in and then they'll just shoot the movie with their face scan. Okay, did they de-age Kurt Russell though or did they Princess Leia him? Th- they oh. Princess Leia him, but the thing is in this movie it's so well done it genuinely looks like they filmed it 20 years ago. But I mean, like, was it him and they, they just CG his face on top of someone else? No, 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 they, no it's him. They just yeah. de-aged him. They, they CG his yeah. face over his face. To look young. <laughs> Yeah, there was no there was no Tron Legacy thing going on here. It didn't look creepy at any point. I, I'm just curious to know, though, uh, favorite scenes from the movie. You are hideous. Yes. Oh, no. Any of Drax's <laughs> interactions with Mantis? That's one thing that maybe bugged me a little bit about this movie, too, is I appreciated in the first film no love subplot. With this one, they sort of have two. But Drax and Mantis are hysterical. Dave Bautista just knocks it out of the park. And if you thought he was funny in the uh, the first movie, his humor is so on point for the entire movie. Every other line out of him, I am just holding my sides crying. I have single-handedly defeated the beast! <laughs> <laughs> for myself, honestly, it was when Rocket was defending the ship 
and he's running from like tree to tree, tra- planting bombs and all of the traps that he had already laid out for all of the Ravagers. He could single handedly defeat an army. Yes. I just love it when it gets down to like him and those two guys, and they're like, hey, what are you going to do without your weapons? And he just pounces and jumps and beats the crap out of them. I'm just like thinking about Rocket Raccoon as a raccoon, and then I'm thinking about myself as a raccoon. He's not a raccoon. (laughs) (laughs) He's a trash panda. (laughs) If I was a raccoon, do you know I would just flop over and eat some garbage probably, and he's just doing all this stuff. (laughs) (laughs) This sounds so stereotypical i loved baby groot <laughs> again i've not seen the first one i don't know what regular groot's supposed to be like but he's this little child cat like thing who's just like i'm adorable yes i am Groot. so you know from theater we have the toppers have you noticed the amount of missing groot toppers <laughs> there, we have four full boxes of characters and one empty groot box alicia you have some explaining to do every single person gets groot as a topper I, 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 that's the one I'm missing. <laughs> so I I'm, got a Groot. So I'm curious, Alicia, what did you think of Teenage Groot? I am Groot. <laughs> <laughs> so for the end of this movie, you have to stay to the end, end of the credits. There's not one, not two, not three, five. There are five mid credit scenes during the credits here, and a lot of them can be okay at least two of them seem important okay two two of them uh yeah no wait two of them two are of important them. i the one with the uh the sovereign yeah of course yes and sylvester still though now i think that might have been my other issue is i don't feel the sovereign was as interesting as a villain as we had uh with the uh what's the other daughter of thanos nebula nebula She was more interesting for me as a villain than she is with her character arc here becoming more of a hero. Are you kidding me? They used an arcade as their entire battle fleet. It (laughs) looks cool, but character-wise, just character-wise, I found the Kree... uh, I can't remember the Kree guy's name either. For as many times as I watched this movie. So the villain's in the first movie, so we have... Ronan the Accuser. Ronan the Accuser. Uh, wasn't particularly interesting, but at least was threatening. And then Nebula was the interesting one. With this one, I don't feel the villains were strong to me, but... I can't say anything. But Kurt Russell, (laughs) I like his arc much better than I like the Sovereign's. I think the Sovereign has more to play out. So one of my favorite parts is when, you know, they have the whole arcade fleet or whatever, and the last guy standing... And the second he gets shot down, everybody who's around you cheering suck. goes, uh, what a, you suck, and walks away. And I'm like, get that scrub. That's exactly, that is how gaming works. So, <laughs> final thoughts on the movie here. Go watch it. I'm probably going to go see it again. I'm absolutely going to go see it again. Watch it. Marvel, I hate you for training people to stay till the end of the credits. Yes. <laughs> Bring your dads to this one Because that's the main theme of this movie And it's fantastic Guys, I want to thank you so much for tuning in Once again to Thunder Geeks Of course, if you want to continue the conversation online You can do so on our Facebook page At facebook.com slash thundergeekspeak Or follow us on our other social media On Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat uh, Podbean And of course, you can now subscribe to us on iTunes Where we'll be posting the uh, the episodes after the show And guys, tune in next week As always, to Thunder Geeks Brought to you by 102.7 FM, C-I-L-U, around the world at L-U Radio, that's yay. I'm Andrew. I'm Rob. I'm Megan. I'm Alicia. And I'm Kyle. And And we're we're your Thunder Thunder Geeks. Geeks. See you next week.